Hi, I'm Russell Trainer. I'm Platform Strategy Director with Envision Technology Solutions. Mainly look after the roadmap of where our technology solutions that we work with the pharma industry and with Medcom's agencies are going into the future. Um, I'm also past president of ISMAP and was one of the founders of the European ISMAP meeting. Today I'm going to talk about publications in the digital world and look at it from a couple of different angles. The world we live in is very digital now. The way we access information has changed hugely over the past 20 or so years. You know, when we look into the past, we went and sat in libraries, did research that way on paper. When I did my university degrees, we were always in the library. Now people are online, searching, getting information via the web. Even within that, though, over the past few years, the way people are searching and what they're searching on has changed. A lot of physicians no longer go through PubMed and use that as the single source for searching for research papers. Ninety-something percent are using Google. You know, we know that from the Google Manhattan Research Project and other things have validated that. As well as that, people are signing up for other ways of getting information. These may be passives, such as RSS feeds, e-table of contents, etc. Or a lot of peer-to-peer -peer referral nowadays, with people passing things on to each other, blogs, Twitter, etc., moving things around. And in terms of the actual consumption of information, people, the way people actually read and interact with information has changed within healthcare, but also generally within our lives, and that's mirrored. If you think about how we access the news nowadays, very few people sit and read a newspaper from cover to cover. People don't have time. People are on their iPads, they're on the BBC News site, they'll read a bit of text, then they'll watch a video, they'll look at some graphics. And we're seeing that as well in healthcare. And a lot of the big publishers now and the big journals have a lot of multimedia. So they have the online journal with the actual articles in, but then they will have videos, fig share sites, etc., etc. So a lot of different ways to access information, and that's changing. We need to bear that in mind as communication professionals, that we need to have content that can be adapted to different routes and different modes of consumption. Congresses are changing as well. The c Congress used to be all about the people who were there on site, but actually now, most of the people who access the content at a Congress aren't there. You know, they're accessing it online, they're watching Twitter feeds or live video feeds in some instances, all over the world. And I think that's something as we see pressures on travel, from cost, from difficulty, from security, continuing to increase. More and more people will actually access Congress information in a virtual way. And a lot of Congresses are very much getting on board with that and, and really pushing the boundaries on that. If we look at number of tweets from ASCO over the past few years, you'll see exponential increase both in number of tweets and number of impressions. Impressions are the number of people who are receiving those tweets. Because obviously if you've got no followers, you can tweet all you like. It doesn't mean anything at all. But huge increase in that. Not everyone doing the same, however. Um, recently, ADA seemed to ask everyone to take down tweets that they'd put up about the conference. Nobody's really sure why. We, uh, presumably they wanted on-site registrations as a primary thing, but it seems a little short-sighted in the modern world, given that that, is, that really is where the world is going. So if we think about the route of a piece of data from a clinical study out through um, publication and beyond, obviously in the past, you might have sent an abstract to a congress. When I started as a medical writer, we had to cut the abstract to fit into a box and then fax it to the conference. That just might mean I've been doing this too long. Um, but nowadays, there's a huge different raft of the ways the data gets out there. So we actually look at the data line that follows through. So there will be often be an abstract and a poster still. That will go into a congress repository, probably online go through the full publication, the data set may be available for further research, obviously go into PubMed and other sites, there might be further review articles, and it will end up on Wikipedia, because that's where everything seems to end up nowadays. But around that, there's now the social media line, which sort of circles around all of these publication activities. You know, and there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's faculty of a thousand commenting on things, patients like me, etc., etc. 
And again, also Wikipedia, because that's where everything seems to end up at the moment. Um, and this was borne out as well by some of the research surveys that have been done um, that show, yes, 92% of searches are done on Google and 70% of Google's searches end up at Wikipedia. So we need to consider that as publication and communication professionals. Where are the information we're putting out ending up? And where does our responsibility start and end with that? And alongside as well, we have the news lines. So we have press releases, BBC Health News picks things up. You know, normally a long while after the fact, after a study is reported and sometimes says, oh, there's a great new cure for Alzheimer's that's around the corner. And it was a phase two study in about three people. But that's what happens. The news gets out and it gets sensationalised. And they pick up on not just the primary publication, or sometimes not even, they're picking up on all these other social media things, which is understandable, but we need to consider where does our responsibility lie in trying to make sure that that noise is correct and given accurate information. Because if you look at how researchers are used and how things are searched, as I said, a lot of things go to Wikipedia and to other areas. When you actually look in terms of reliability of the sources people go to, over here on the right hand side, very few people end up going to the most reliable source of information. The primary manuscript should be the most reliable source. It's been checked against the clinical study report, etc. Independent review articles, again, they're peer reviewed, they're going to be high quality. And then you get regulated web resources, so Medscape, publishers' own websites will be cross checking back to the primary source of data. And then you get all that other raft of places that people go, and it might be someone's Twitter comments are picked up by things, or non regulated sites where other people can edit. Is it accurate? We don't know. It's a bit of a wild west at times. So then turning to see how things are interacting with these new media and what, what's, what's influencing different things. It's quite interesting, looking at searches around congresses that were relevant and then related searches on Wikipedia. And every time there's a congress or an FDA approval of something in the disease area, the Wikipedia searches spike noticeably. And we've done this across a couple of different therapy areas and it does seem to be a very common pattern. So clearly, Congress news or tweets out from the Congresses or the fact that people are there is leading people to search. But it's very much leading to a spike in things like Wikipedia, other general Google searches, etc. So there is an influence from traditional communication methods through to the new. And we'll come in a minute to how that works the other way around as well. In terms of assessing journal options in this new digital arena. There's a lot more than just the journal. And when we look at some of the things that are offered and the selection of offerings are huge across different journals um, in terms of obviously online availability of the articles, but then are they putting it out onto social media? Are there associated multimedia videos that go with it or animations, other infographics, that sort of material that goes there. And that becomes very important when talking to our authors and people who are working with us on publications, in terms of not just considering the reach of the paper publication, need to consider the online reach, but also consider all of the other things that are available and the ways people can interact with that information. Because as healthcare practitioners more and more become Generation X, Millennials, and the older generations move off into retirement, those multimedia channels will be more and more important as we go forward. When we look at, uh, into that a bit more deeply and we look at what is a good buzz around an article in social media, it's been shown that journals that have a good level of social media interaction and output across an entire year are more likely to get a good generation of interest in an article when one comes out. Whereas a publisher or a journal that doesn't do very much throughout the year but then spikes when there's occasional articles because not many people are following them on the social medias, it doesn't have the same impact, doesn't create the same buzz. So actually the level of activity across the year can be important in looking and assessing that. Demographics of followers of the social media that the journals are putting out, very, very important. Um, typically, you see that on more general medical journals, you get a lot more lay followers. 
that you know people have heard of the New England Journal, the Lancet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So people in the lay public will follow those. Generally speaking, more specialist journals will get more specialist audiences following the social media within that. There are some exceptions with some therapy and disease areas that have very, very um, active patient populations um, in terms of researching their own conditions. Um, so you sometimes see a lot more of those following on. Oncology, typically, you would see that a lot. But generally speaking, a more specialist journal will probably have the following on social media that you want. So reaching out to those guys. Um, journals are getting very up to speed with social media. Um, one of our, my colleagues put a um, publication in on behalf of the client and the authors into European Urology and got the request back of please include a 120 character summary for being sent out as a tweet. Um, presumably they were 20 characters short of the maximum so they can add their, their link on and their web link on to do that. That's great, they're really getting on board with this and doing it. Interesting considerations, potential breaches of ABI code on direct consumer. You know, it's, it's something we're going to have to be careful of as communication professionals and work with our clients on a way to actually work through that and a procedure for doing that with the legal and regulatory teams. But it's nice to see that they're, they're asking for that and getting involved. Um, we talked a little bit about the effect of congresses and, and more traditional activities on social media. When we look in reverse, um, PLOS One did some interesting research seeing how the downloads and views of a number of articles were affected by their social media um, output. So they did a control section where they didn't actually put out any material, which is on the left-hand side of each of those um, graphs. And then they spent a week of blogging about it, putting it on Facebook, their Facebook feeds, Twitter feeds, LinkedIn, and both the HTML views and the PDF views increased quite substantially following that. So it is having an impact. People are seeing these things on social media, reacting to them, and actually going back to the core articles and reading those. Which brings us to how we assess the impact of the things we're putting out in the modern digital age. Um, if we look back into the past, some of the more traditional metrics are becoming somewhat outdated. Impact factor um, is often misused as the impact of an individual article. You know, it's not, it's the, it's the entire journal gets the impact factor. But, for example, Nature's impact factor in 2004, 90% of that impact factor was based on less than a quarter of their articles. Um, so you can't really use it for an article level. And with the way we work in the modern world, people download a single article. They don't necessarily download an entire issue of a journal. They go on and they view that article they're interested in. So we need to shift from journal impact to article impact in order to really assess how we're doing. Citations are a great measure of article impact, but with the best will in the world, you're probably at least a year after publication before you get your first citation. They take a long time to build up. Um, so we need to look at some more immediate measures that the article impact's having. So, for example, um, looking again at PLOS, um, they do a lot of article level metrics um, nowadays, which is great. Number of views, number of article views that then led to a PDF download, which I think is really interesting because it shows that people are going from looking at the brief summary through to actually downloading the, the PDF. Um, references, comparing averages in the subject area. A lot of really valuable data. You can see how your article's doing um, within the world. And I know more and more publishers are starting to put together similar packages of data. Altmetrics um, really provide a very immediate indicator of the impact an article is making. Um, obviously, you can get into some looks in terms of whether that's positive or negative, in terms of the sentiment, but even just numerically, you know, the number of tweets, the number of blogs that are reporting it, what page views it's on, that sort of thing, is really, really valuable to do. Um, we're actually just completed an agreement with altmetric.com that that is, data is going to be available in Data Vision from next year. Um, there are also other systems and suppliers, obviously Plum Analytics, the Impact Story, but really that immediate view works nicely alongside the formal citations which come slightly later and down the line. So, as a take-home summary from this, as the consumption of publications and scientific communications is becoming ever more digital in nature and multi-channel and people are looking for different ways, 
we need to make sure that we're keeping our awareness of that as communication professionals up, making sure we're talking to clients about the options and working with publishers to make sure that we are getting the right impact and we're giving people information in the manner that they want to actually um, consume it in their busy lives nowadays between patient visits, etc., etc. Thank you.